For the final round of the 2015 Blancpain Endurance Series, the teams head to the Nürburgring. It's the traditional venue for the last round of the championship, but this year it's a three-hour race, and that means there are fewer points on offer for a number of teams because there is so much up for grabs over the course of the final race. The Pro Cup, the Am Cup, and all the teams' competitions are going to be resolved this weekend. And when you factor in a 55-car grid and the unpredictable weather from the Nordschleife area, this could be a great race. Last time out, it was the Spa 24 hours, and rain affected the start of the race as McLaren from Von Rahn Racing led the way. Another huge grid of cars poured uphill for the first time, and only three corners into the race, the incident started as the ISR Audi rotated and glanced an AF Corsa Ferrari as it went by. Mark VDS was losing places early in the race. Both cars perhaps slightly wrong on setup, and they were dropping down the order. As the road dried, they worked their way back into contention. The HTP Bentley with one car working its way up the order. But it wasn't long before we had the first safety car period of the race. Gilles Ducan got it wrong in the Ferrari heading up to the Ecole, ploughed into the barrier, did a lot of damage to the front of the car and to the Armco itself. But worse was to come. On the restart, McLarens led the way. Both the Von Rahn racing cars looking good at the front of the field. Lawrence Vantour was trying to work his way up the order in Audi number one. Vantour, one of the winners of the event the previous year. But then, safety car period number two. Carrie Moge had a huge off at the top of Radion. Out came the safety car. Others went for the pit lane, and some were delayed as they had to wait for the crocodile of cars to go past. There was more drama as people got it wrong at the bottom of the hill. On the restart, another sizable accident. This time, Lawrence Vantour was involved in an off, and the pit stop started to cycle through in earnest. As light fell, there was another incident that eliminated the Mercedes down at the first corner, and with it, Nico Verdon was out of the race. Van Tours off meant a lot of damage had to be repaired. The car would get back into the race, but many places down. For the teams, there was a long night as they had to battle their way through the darkness, others coming out unscathed. The Bentley number seven, rather less so. As dawn broke, it was a battle still between BMW, Mercedes and Audi. A Mark VDS number 46 car worked its way up into third place at the expense of the Rover Racing Mercedes. But then the leading car had the engine seize. It spun out of the race and suddenly the pendulum swung back in favour of Audi. But Nick Katzberg at the wheel of the second Mark VDS BMW was not to be denied. The second car suddenly came alive. It bagged third, it moved up to second, and then grabbed the race lead. Alessandro Zanardi's BMW was rather less fortunate. That had an engine problem right towards the end of the race and was a retirement. The drama befell the Rover Racing Mercedes as well. That was a casualty with just over an hour to go. At the last pit stops, the sole surviving Mark VDS BMW was cycled back into the race in double quick time, and it was a win for Nick Katzberg, Lucas Law, and Marcus Paltola after so many years of trying. Drivers on the podium, a historic win in the Belgian Classic for the Belgian Mark BDS racing team. It was a very popular result with everybody up the pit lane as well as for the fans. Mark BDS triumphant in the Spa 24 hours. Well, can you believe it? The sun is shining at the Nürburgring. The final round of the Blancpain Endurance Series is going to get underway under sunny skies. 55 cars making their way round onto the grid. Qualifying this morning began at half past eight. It was pretty overcast to say the least. It was pretty cool, but the grid is a jumbled one and that is going to add extra fun and games in the opening few laps of the race. Lamborghini will start on pole. Adrian Zaug at the wheel with two Nissans, Ketsamasa Chio and Craig Dolby second and third on the grid. McLaren fourth, Mercedes fifth and Bentley sixth and seventh. So looking forward to a great race in prospect, but also, of course, to see how the different classes are going to be sorted out within the championship. And the real focus is going to be not only for the overall win, but on the Pro Cup championship as well. And yesterday, we had the opportunity to talk to some of the leading drivers about their chances, their thoughts, their hopes going in to this final race. The Pro Cup is going to be fiercely contested this weekend with six different combinations that could come out on top. And one of them is Laurence Vantour, no stranger to winning GT titles. He's home to play catch-up. He needs a good haul of points this weekend. And a lot of that is due to the fact that he scored badly in the Spa 24 hours. Unfortunately, due to my own mistake, uh, at Spa, where we were leading the big race, uh, I 
crashed. Uh, we lost a lot of points. I made a, a mistake which I knew I should not do in the circumstances which were there, but I got distracted and was not focused on the end goal which I need to be focused on. And I made a mistake. Was some sleepless nights after that for sure, but uh, now it's back to normal and confidence back there. So I will go out and attack 100% like I usually do. It's gonna be hard, but I won a championship last year, won the race here last year. I'm not gonna give the championship over without a fight. Leading the Pro Cup is another of the fleet of WRT Belgian Audi Club Audis. The number two car, Frank Stifler and Stefan Ortelli, two of the drivers of the three behind the wheel this weekend. Stifler and Ortelli could be champion. And here you have two experienced drivers, the old guard in a sense, going up against the young guns. And in Ortelli and Frank Stifler, there's bags of experience behind the wheel. The WRT team uh, makes a tremendous job I and mean, it's always an honor to, to be part of it. Usually the young guys uh, were slightly faster, but uh, during the season now um, the old-timer driver lineup is uh, slightly better positioned, so uh, it's always a big challenge to work against the young ones. Well, certainly we hope for the title, uh, we try to do our best and uh, on Sunday evening we will know uh, if it was uh, good enough. But don't rule out Bentley in the competition for the Pro Cup either. Last year, the car had two overall race wins. This year, Bentley has been winless. But despite that, they're still in contention. Guy Smith, Andy Merrick and Stephen Kane, the three drivers in Bentley number seven. And come the end of Sunday afternoon, this, again, could be a car that takes the drivers to the overall championship in the Pro Cup. It's great to be back, um, back at Nürburgring, Bentley Team M Sports. Um, fighting for both championships. Really looking forward to the race. Winning the Drivers' Championship is going to be a little bit tough. Um, it's not all in our control, but all we can do is try and win the race. But we're still in the fight for the team's championship. It would be really deserving for the team to win it. For us, it would be great to win a race by the end of the year. So that's what we're going to try and do. And we're going to be pushing the whole weekend for it. For so many years, we've talked about Nissan in the context of perhaps winning in Pro-Am. But this year, the change of policy within the brand means that there's been a Pro Cup entry for the full season. Not only that, but it had its first outright win at Paul Ricard in that fabulous six-hour race, 1,000-kilometer event going back to late June. And that means that Alex Buncombe, Wolfgang Wright, and Katsumasa Chio could be champions. The car was quite good, and the team did a very, really good job. And uh, every pit stop was no mistake. And the uh, drivers had no mistake as well. We could show the good performance in Paul Ricard, and we feel very confident. We are still have big possibility to get Championship. I'm very looking forward to fight for big title, so we are ready to crack on the last race. Remember that in the Blancpain Endurance Series you score points at the end of each race, but for Spa you score points at 6 hours and 12 hours. And because of good pace there, this car, the Rover Racing Mercedes, is in contention for honours in the Pro Cup as well. In a sense, it's a surprise because it hasn't been a race winner all year, but with Steph Dusseldorf behind the wheel, it's been quick. We're on pay three in the championship right now. We're uh, within nine points of the lead, so it's very good. We didn't expect to find ourselves in this position, but we scored very constantly in every race, and we're the only pro uh, pair who scored points in every race, so that's, that's very good. I know this track is very good for a Mercedes, but it's good for a lot of cars as well. So, you know, we need to be very much on the limit uh, to be there and to, to score points. If we're blank Pine champions at the end of the Sunday race, it would be great. You know, it would be the first major title for both of us, and uh, all the time and effort we put in would have been uh, more than worth it. It's been quite a year for Lamborghini. The GRT Grassa Racing Team has taken over running the cars in Blancpain as part of Lamborghini Squadra Corsa. The two cars have been competitive all year. There was a win at Monza for car number 19, and the two cars together mean that the Lamborghini squad is still in contention for honours in the team standings. It's definitely been a success uh, for the whole team, for us drivers, uh, for the factory, Lamborghini, you know, a new program, new project with a new Huracan GT3. We're racing in a very competitive championship like the Blancpain Endurance Series, where we have 60 plus cars on the grid, very competitive field. It's never easy, but we, we managed to, to be competitive straight away, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this last race here at the Nürburgring. Definitely, we will give it everything we've got uh, to take the maximum result. There is one class of the championship, though, that has already been decided. Pro-Am was sorted out at Spa. Duncan Cameron and Matt Griffith, the winners. And again, they've done that by scoring points very well indeed over the course of the year. It means then that they can come to the Nürburgring with the pressure off and just enjoy one final three-hour blast of the season. And Matt Griffith, the Irishman, is bound to be as quick as ever. 
a championship of this stature is, is fantastic and to win it with a round in hand is, is superb. But obviously turning uh, attentions to this weekend obviously is a lot less pressure than if we were fighting for the championship. In saying that Nürburgring is a super track, it's a fantastic facility, really, really challenging. I'm sure the race is going to be really competitive and exciting like usual and from our point of view I've come here to win and finish the season on a high. And the other class to be decided this afternoon is the AM Cup. At the moment, it's headed by Julian Westwood and Ian Logging in the Team Parker Racing Run Audi. And that, in part, is on the back not only of a great season, but a massively impressive run in the Spa 24 hours. Ian Logging could well leave Germany as the AM Cup champion. I, we really struggled in the start of the, the season, but not pace, but bad luck. We were hit a couple of times when we should have picked up some points, but a good job was done in Spa, and uh, now sitting first, the championship, ours to win or lose, so it's really down to us. The key thing is, the 55 cars out there, as an arm driver, you've got to stay out of trouble. Give way to the faster cars, keep it safe, keep it tidy, and the race will come to us. So, yeah, we're pretty confident in the moment. Take one deep breath as the last race of the year in the Endurance Series, John, is set to get underway. Well, Gio, who's the lightest driver in the field, probably one of the smallest, may have a slight advantage, but really, it's going to be eyeball to eyeball at turn one. Here we go, lights out, the race underway. Mirko Bortolotti it is who sprints away, as up the inside tries to go Craig Dolby in the black and turquoise Nissan. Can he squeeze into the race lead? Yes, he can. Fantastic, Dolby leads. Up the inside goes the Mercedes of Hubert Haupt as well. To the outside line is Gio. There's contact between the two Bentleys that lean on each other. Harry Tignall gets forced out wide in his GT debut in the red, white and blue Nissan. The Jaguar has gone wide at turn one as well. But they sprint their way through the Mercedes arena for the first time. Stefan Mucker has got the Aston going strongly. He is looking to gain ground as the cars work their way through for the first time. The triple three Ferrari with Renat Salikov at the wheel tries to squeeze up the inside of number 59 McLaren. Alvaro Parent has fallen back over the first few corners as we accelerate then now down towards turns five and six for the first time. Oh, no, it's just, oh, and all you can do is just hold position, hope for a gap and uh, let's get back to the lead because that was a blinding start by Craig Dolby on road two to unaccelerate the pole position and that was the pole position uh, the, the Lamborghini they we see in view and right now the Mercedes has got ahead of Chio as well so great start from the Mercedes from that third row of the grid Hubert Hout, the driver, who knows his way around here, hugely experienced driver, now on board with Ketzelmasa Chio as he works his way now up through the Schumacher S's, lots of kerb taken there Everybody is kept out of trouble just about for the first few corners, but Craig Dolby underlining that he's a real talent and also underlining that now with a different band of people operating this net and it is going incredibly well. Up towards the end of the opening lap, then out of the Wilstein curve, 31, Bentley, that is the car in the hands of Max Buch, ahead of the championship contender number seven, with Guy Smith at the wheel as the cars head towards the end of lap one. Yeah, it's Max Buch, the car I'm going to keep an eye on, Bentley 31, all over the rear of the Nissan number 23 coming up into the chicane, but in fact both Bentley's nose to tail, and they look, the other Nissan uses all that horsepower that had to get past the 99 Mercedes into the chicane. And Max Buch there having a nibble at the back of the traffic ahead of him. Now Guy Smith looking for a way through as well as they come over the timing line. Dolby leading Zaug. In third is Haupt. Fourth is Chio. Fifth is Book. Sixth is Guy Smith that you were riding with a moment ago. Seventh over the timing line is Parent. Eighth is Salikov. Ninth is Jean-Carl Verne. And look at this. Three wide for tenth down at turn one. Verne's got eighth up the inside. Round the outside of Tignall there goes Nico Bastian. Is he going to come out ahead? Yes he is. The Mercedes goes by. Regains that position. It was lost a couple of corners ago but uh, Bastian did a good job put the Mercedes in the right part of the racetrack and got the benefit going into turn one. Replay of the start then as the cars accelerated over the line. Good start by Mirko Bortolotti, but what a move by Dolby up the inside. I mean, in a sense, the two front row grid cars are watching each other and they didn't think about Craig Dolby, but of course, he's got an identical car to Chio in the at number 23 Nissan. And we know the Nissan with that turbocharged V6 engine coming off the rolling start has got that bottom end grunt that can drag the car the initial maybe first 50 or 60 metres, really give it a good punch. And again, a replay in the pack of the two Bentleys getting together and making contact with each other. And have a look at this, looking back from Bentley number seven, they come down towards turn number one. Guy Smith at the wheel of this car. And there's a bit of contact with the McLaren, so that was Alvaro Parent losing out. And then there's the little whack that gets the car all unsettled. 
replay of the start from Chio's point of view. Yeah, I think just a little bit of nerves on the part of Chio. I mean, overwhelming being in the, you know, the front row, effectively being pull position, but you can see Craig Dolby, he wasn't overwhelmed. He saw the gap on the right-hand side, it's a right-hand corner, and as long as he can get his Nissan stopped without overrunning, and he just about did it, did it, he was able to take the lead from the Lamborghini, and of course, Chio, in doing so, went from second on the grid, the front row of the grid, back to fourth, two places lost. And off the road has gone Gary Kondakov in the Kaspersky Ferrari, that's at the chicane. It's well and truly beached in the gravel. Now, let's hope this doesn't either have a circuit full course, yellow or a safety car. It's in the gravel, it will have to be retrieved. It wouldn't be able to get himself out of there. Now, what did he do all wrong? Well, just trying to get out of the way, fundamentally, to be the decent guy, and, uh, of course, onto the gravel. And once it then spins and buries itself going sideways like that, it'll not be able to reverse out. So it'll need a, a truck to pull that car away from the corner and hopefully it'll get it back into the race. And now look, Chio is under attack. Hubert Hout gets to drive up the hill, get all the grunt from the Mercedes. We've seen it here every season in Blancpain. Over the kerb goes Hout. That compromises his run, and now Guy Smith makes a move up the inside. But it's the outside for the next corner. They lean on each other. Hubert Hout's got the inside line. He'll go back ahead. He takes the place back again. And Max Book arrives on the tail of Guy Smith as well. Good effort that by Guy Smith. Opportunistic stuff. It did not quite pay off. Safety At least it has picked up the race leader. It has indeed. Important, important. No, it's, that is really crucial that it picks up the race leader so no one in effect has lost out except this man in the lead, Craig Dolby. All that hard work he did to build up a nine and a half second advantage. It's gone. Wolfgang Wright there, the bespectacled Alex Bunkham watching on with uh, Darren Cox in the red coat, the Global Motorsport Manager of Nissan, as Bastia has a cheeky look at the inside of Parent. Doesn't work going into the chicane. Can he make a run up the inside of the Coca-Cola curve? He thought about it. Parent moves across and defends. But watch off this corner. Parent had to go defensive, didn't get the best line into the corner. Bastian had a better exit. The gap between the two cars is pretty static. And let's see if the Mercedes has got any more horsepower down oh. the straight. Coming over the line, the other Nissan has just creamed itself up against the pit wall, and that has got debris on the road. We're going to end up with another safety car. I fear as Perrette gets assaulted by Bastian at turn one, and round he goes into the gravel. Two separate incidents on the restart. And that will also probably see a penalty for the Mercedes because that was an avoidable contact. Perrette was ahead. He got tagged on the right rear by the Mercedes Benz, and it's in the gravel trap, but we've got it again. A yellow flag, whether the can be retrieved more quickly or it's going to be another safety car. But we've also got this Nissan that's parked on the pit straight. Harry Tinknell's car got contact coming out of the last corner, went into the pit wall and it's out of the race with a lot of damage and it's on the pit straight facing the wrong way. So uh, we've got two incidents within the first part of the lap which are going to have to be attended to. And there is the Nissan in question. Harry Tinknell's car up against the pit wall. Darren Cox not happy about that nor will Von Ryan be about this site because the car is in the gravel at turn one. Number six, Marcus Winkelhock versus Greg Gilvair, and Winkelhock goes round the outside there, going out of the Dunlop curve. It is possible to overtake there. Yes, but I mean, in fairness, Marcus Winkelhock slightly ahead of the curve, literally, in this case, metaphorically, in terms of driver skill and ability, and just used that experience to put himself ahead of the sister ID up the hill into now turn 10. So, Harry Tinknell off on the pit straight, but with a bit of an assistance. And number 99 has got a punctured tyre, if not worse, as a result of the contact yeah, with absolutely. Alvaro Perez. Yeah, left, front, right, rear. I mean, the Mercedes had contact. It's ne inevitable you're going to cut a sidewall of a tyre down when you have that kind of contact, both with, from the mechanical part of the car. And there is Harry Tinknell getting out of his car, and uh, what a disappointment. I mean, I've never seen a car facing the wrong way on the Nürburgring. It must have been, I don't know what kind of contact it would have been from the rear or whether just it was, well, we have to find out from Harry, he'll be back in the Nissan garage very quickly. And there's a driver change going on at 99 as well, look. So Nico Bastien, having had to make that early stop, they're going to treat it as a mandatory stop now and therefore change the strategy. So they've lost time on the inlet because of the puncture. Nico Bastien will have a few words to say about it, I'm sure, but now they're going to try and stay on their own strategy, do the driver change, do the refuel and not fall too far down. They're going down the pit road, briefly you saw number one Audi, double wave yellows all the way down the start and finish line as the Harry Tignall Nissan is being retrieved and we understand news from the pits that Harry Tignall's car
cut out coming out of the last corner and he got a whack from behind from somebody, which then turned him around. I mean, what can happen is if you run up against the limiter, some of, some engine limiters are quite aggressive and it literally just cuts everything. Yeah. And it, it, the effect is that suddenly the car stops going forward. And if somebody's right on your tail, of course, they're going to be completely wrong-footed by it. And that could be just quite as simple as that. The track is clear once more. Up front, Craig Dolby's getting away. The gap is extending, not quite as markedly as it was before the safety car, but it is building, as you can see. It's still Zaug, ahead of Chio, ahead of Hout, ahead of Smith, ahead of Book, ahead of Engel, because, of course, he's up to seventh now with the dramas for Nico Bastian. Steph Dusseldorp took the car over and is in 48th place. And Steph Dusseldorp right now actually pulling away from Craig Dolby, which is quite normal because he's got a brand-new set of tyres, and there's another Mercedes with a non, not a non-familiar problem. The gull wing is doing its gull thing and uh, is... And you can't, the driver can't reach it from no, the seat no. because he's held in so tightly by the six-point seat belt harness. But the battle, look at this, for third place, still is intense. The Lamborghini has dropped away from the tail of the lead Nissan and it was literally within one lap of the safety car being withdrawn, falling away. Craig Dolby again lapping in the middle 157, whereas the Lamborghini lapping in the low 158. And what we've been seeing through the race, we're now seeing a repeat of, with the exception of the Nico, Nico Bastion, and let's look at again this manoeuvre down the inside. Well, in fact, in fairness, he was almost side by side, but of course he was too quick at the point when the McLaren wanted to turn in. I think that might be reviewed, and the blame that I would put on Nico Bastion, when I now see it from this perspective, there's a, maybe a little bit... The, the Mercedes could not turn, it was too tight mm. to the apex, and the McLaren did commit. So that will probably go down as a racing incident because both drivers might have been or could have done maybe a bit more to avoid that collision. But I'm sure Alvaro Brent will feel I was driven off the racetrack and I think it would be very hard to persuade him otherwise. So there's the driver change for 63. Let's see where that car feeds back in after this pit stop. So now Dolby leads Chio. It's a Nissan 1-2. It's Mercedes 3 and then it's Bentley 4-5. Smith ahead of Book. Uh, sixth is Mauro Engel now. And Marcus Winkelhock has done Good stuff for Ernst Moser's Phoenix team. He's brought number six up into seventh place now. Number 63 comes up over the timing line. And the Lamborghini, after its first pit stop, is quite a long way down the order now. But, of course, number one Audi pitted much, much earlier and has been out of traffic, therefore. They've got Robin Fritz behind the wheel. And so on the pit stops, number one Audi has gained hugely against 63. Now, partly a gain from the... Audi, what we don't know is whether it was a bad pit stop because we didn't see all of it from the Lamborghini squad, but certainly that car has lost relative to the Audi. Well, it may have been a, a, may have been a normal stop for the Grasso Lamborghini team, but we know that WRT are mega in their pit stops. That's where they will snatch victory from the jaws of defeat, and that's the key, as I pointed out earlier in the race, that the ultimate result of this race will be determined by what happens here in the pit lane rather than what's going to happen on the circuit. And significantly, Mirko Bortolotti at the wheel of that Lamborghini has done the best middle sector of anybody in the race thus far. He's only done a lap and a bit, so he's absolutely flying. As there, look, Stuart Leonard is under attack because for second in Pro-Am, Freddie Bath is right on the tail of him in the Jaguar. Two British marks together, the Emil Frey Jaguar looks for a way by now. And for the first time, you're saying race leader losing his advantage because second place 23 Nissan was quicker on the last lap by, what, nine tenths of a second. Again, no doubt due to traffic but that's the first point at any point within an hour that that gap has started to go backwards rather than go forwards. So we've had the change up into second has gone the Jaguar for Pro-Am second place. Up the inside, Freddie Bath, then he gains the position away from Stuart Leonard. Can he get away? Sprints away, yes, he does get away. So up front, we've got the lead gap coming down and there you've got second and third in Pro-Am having reversed themselves as well. There's still a huge amount shuffling out of this and then you've got the pit stops being cycled through as well. So there's going to be another big, big jump in the order soon. 51 Ferrari out of Pro-Am has just pitted the Cameron Griffin car. There's the leader, but as John rightly says, a shrinking advantage. There is a drive-through penalty for the 99 Mercedes for causing a collision. That's the Dusseldorf Bastian Jean-Cadea car, a drive-through penalty for causing a collision. And he's coming in at the earliest opportunity. Get it out of the way and just get on with it and forget about it. So Steph Dusseldorf comes down the pit lane and the race leader is in the pits as well. Look, there is Craig Dolby. So he loses the lead now to Katsumasa Chio, but round of applause for Craig Dolby's first stint. John applauds. Excellent Absolutely. job. I mean, that's what you expect from a driver. <laughs> Been given an opportunity in a competitive car, done a brilliant job, done all he was requested to do, required to do. 
So now in gets Sean Walkinshaw. Now this is a big, big challenge. Yes. Sean Walkinshaw needs to get this car turned around, get it back out. The gap between first and second, which was, was with the 23 Nissan, was just about four seconds at the point. So this is going to be about quick pit stop. And I think always evolving motorsport, who are now running this car, they will see if they can do a better job than the previous operators. But away goes the Nissan. And there, look, is the Audi that comes down the pit straight. So number one has just bought itself another spot, and the Lamborghini will go ahead of the Nissan as well. Number one, with that decision to pit early, has gained itself huge amounts of ground, and the Nissan has fallen back behind the 63 Lamborghini also. More Nissan pit stops. Katsumasa Chio is in. You're riding with him as he comes down the pit lane. So that's going to give Hubert Hout the lead, going a long way in the Mercedes relative to the others. Bentley's yeah. likewise. Yeah, we've got the two Bentleys also following behind in second and third place. So they're going to be having to make their pit stops within the next two, three laps. There is the car that has dominated this race since the lights went out, but then the pit stop round lost its lead. Sean Wolkenshaw behind the wheel. He's going to get back ahead of the, the number 23 Nissan, in my view, because the Nissan just beginning to roll. It's, it's well, let's have a look and see. Robin Friends in the Audi look, he's going to get ahead potentially. Here comes no, Ryan up to speed. No, he's but not. he can't get the line for the white line yet. So the Audi's on the outside line into the corner. Can he get the undercut as they turn through a convolved gang ripe hang on to track position? Robin Friends up to speed, everything up to temperature. He goes round the outside up the inside of the Audi now. Goes Bortolotti, they touch. The Lamborghini is going to go through, so Bortolotti moves himself up ahead of the Audi, and Wolfgang Reip has just been able to hang on to the place. Well, Reip did all he could, and he did the best job, and he kept the Nissan ahead, but it was poor the, the uh, Robert Friens, I should say, in the Audi that got suddenly compromised and wasn't awaiting, didn't expect to see the Lamborghini being as aggressive and forceful, but the momentum was with the Lamborghini, and it's still with Bortolotti in the Lamborghini who is going to give Wolfgang Reip another working out down the yeah. hill into turn seven and then all the way back up the hill through turns eight, nine and into ten. Don't forget Bortolotti, the quickest man on the circuit. He's done the best lap. Hubert Hout, by the way, is pitted. So Guy Smith and Max Boot now are first and second, but they've not stopped. So, of course, when they do, they'll drop down the order and everything will be corrected. What we need to see, though, is where they all feed back in after this first round of pit stops. But Wolfgang Reip, effectively the race leader then, ahead of Mirko Bortolotti, but Robin Frins running in that third spot of those that have made a pit stop. Excellent decision by the WRT team. Bortolotti's car tries to get up the inside, but Wolfgang Reip He's certainly under big, big attack, isn't he, as they come off the final corner. Remember, before the pit stops, the Lamborghini was ahead. Over the timing line they come, then now, right, then Bortolotti, then Frins. Here comes the Bentley, but he's going to lose places as it gets out of the pit lane. Down to turn one, now to the inside, looks Bortolotti in the Lamborghini. Couldn't do that. Well, Bortolotti was just left standing, the power of the Nissan off, turn 15. Just nothing the Lamborghini could do. Wolfgang right break, maybe normal place. And I think Bortolotti thought, I'll have a bit of this because I can maybe slide down. Maybe, I think, the Lamborghini driver feeling that he can maybe have an opportunity under brakes into turn one. He sort of tested the water on that lap. Next time round, if he's in the position, he's going to be looking a little bit more seriously at taking a position away from the Nissan. In the AM Cup, Karimoje is the category leader at the moment from Anthony Pons Ferrari in Jürgen Herring's Porsche. And there is the leading AM BMW. It's the middle of those three. It's the black and orange car. Remember, it had its big accident at Spa, but Karim Moje, class winner at Silverstone, leading the way here as well as they come over the line. Ferrari tucked up behind to try to make the move. That's out of the Pro-Am category as they drop down towards Turn 1. And the Francisco Guedes car is allowed by. There's no point fighting that. No, I mean, I'm just thinking back to Spa. That was one almighty... Accident and yeah. there's still a bit of damage on the left front of the, the BMW. I don't know whether the air deflectors looking like they've slightly been deflected themselves. There's the battle and right on the gearbox and the, under the rear wing and also the Bentley doing the same thing. So Andy Merrick not shy and putting his foot in the door and trying to force an issue. And this has got through the Audi's drop back one place. And it could lose another, couldn't it? Because Merrick has arrived on the scene as well. So the Audi in this stint potentially wilting, but they've got to get him for at least another at least another 20 minutes before they can think about a pit stop. There's the time. I mean, just Sean Walkinshaw just took a punt, went down the inside. Robin Friens decided that, you know, I'm, I want to finish this race. We've got one more pit stop to go. We can regain probably our position in the pit stop, so don't let's cause any damage to the car. And there, Andy Merrick, he's feeling a bit feisty. He thinks, I want to get alongside that ID. Once I can do that, I can get ahead, and then I can put further heat onto the rear of the third place uh, Nissan. 
through the Mercedes arena they come. Bortolotti to the inside, and the back marker spins, and thankfully they both missed the number three Audi, but Walkinshaw is delayed as a consequence. Now, it was that contact that looked to me like it could have been contact. There was no obvious reason for the Audi just suddenly to lose it. It was only driving its own race, but there we see the Lamborghini, no obvious signs of contact, but it only had to be in a very, very light lean on the, the left rear corner for the Audi to lose traction. Fortunately, it didn't catch the, the Nissan, which went to the right-hand side of the spinning Audi. There's been a big accident there that I think is the HTP Bentley that's come to grief coming out of that's Turn a, 6. It yeah. is Harold Primat's last ever race. He was going to call time on his career, has been called early, and it, there's debris all over the place. Yeah, he's hit the barrier heavily on the right-hand side of the screen, left-hand side coming down the hill, and it's spewed. Look at the bodywork. I mean, yeah. Whatever caused the car to hit the barrier there, I've never seen anything but that will be a safety car because there's masses of bodywork fortunately Harold Primat is out of the car damage also to the barrier but that was a massive hit that needs to be cleared now let's look and see there, there's the car coming oh he's off he hits he got a hit from behind didn't he I'm not sure he got hit from behind certainly he went there you can see the bodywork shredding itself and shedding itself into the middle of the track so whether that was a t contact on the exit of turn six or whether that was just running slightly wide and the back end of the Bentley just went too wide and the car then snatched back and it just simply had no chance. And once it's on the grass, the grass is saturated here at now. Uh, it was off into the, the barrier and nothing that uh, could be done to save it. Leader in, second in, and now the safety car is going to pick up anybody it can find. Well, if anybody can catch the safety car before the safety car line goes out, it'd be quite a because there's, oh, there you can see the cars that are now, they're probably about a couple of seconds behind. Yeah. And they will be on the tail of the safety car, but that's can't they get done so, to the end of the pit straight. Those cars that came in that earliest opportunity are all filtering their yeah. way back down. There's the Nissan. So now the right side there is the idea of bike to come on. The idea, I think, is ahead in terms of the pit stop. So the, the, the angle the Nissan is in, it's making it very tight. Even the angle of the Audi is in. Makes it very tight to change the right-hand side tires. The Nissan's got to be pushed back, and it comes Ooh. out. Oh! Stays well, ahead, but only just. That, I mean, that was released. And where was the Audi? Still... Well, significantly, the Bentley's ahead of the Lamborghini. There's the Audi coming out. But the Bentley has gained on the pit stop, so that's gained up one spot. The Audi falls to fourth on the release, but Bentley number seven is the winner on that. It's got ahead of the Lamborghini. So remember that that car had dropped not only behind the Lamborghini and the Audi, but the other Bentley. It's really bought in at the end of that pit stop, hasn't it? It certainly has. Good work by the Bentley boys. Now, after all those pit stops, the car to watch is 58, because Kevin Est has made two pit stops, and that car is ahead of the Alex Buncombe Nissan. So the Von Ryan McLaren, remember that pitted very, very early in the first stint, after the second stop, is now ahead of the Alex Buncombe Nissan, so the orange McLaren is in fourth place, it's done its two pit stops, and that therefore, for the moment, is in a very, very, very good position. That's not the story of the moment, the story <laughs> of the moment is Stephen Kane in seventh place, fastest first and third sectors, a 1 minute 55.9. Fastest lap of the race. Wow. But he's still effectively third, this then is the car that is the notional race leader, so as soon as the next stops have cycled through, then it is going to be in the box seat because the two pit stops are done and it's the leading two-stopping car then. So Kevin Est at the wheel of the McLaren and what sort of advantage has he got over Alex Bunker? Let's wait and see. Look at all that empty track, a yawning, yawning gap before the Nissan there arrives. So Alex Bunker is still on for a good result, but can he catch the McLaren before the very end? Again, up into turn, final 15. So. Let's watch and see what Lawrence Van Thor can do again, right at the back of the Lamborghini. Lamborghini having to go defensive into the middle of the track, forcing the Audi. If you're going to go down the inside, you're going to have to break earlier than me. So it's the Lamborghini that opts to go down the inside. The Audi goes slightly wider. Watch for the cutback, but Van Thor really isn't able to get on the par any earlier than he can manage. Again, has to fall in behind the rear wing of the Lamborghini, but real nip and tuck stop. Now, trying to get up the inside, going into turn three. Again, oh, oh, oh. tags are back. No, that was... No, the, I was going to say the Lamborghini is coming back. Now, whether that will be again, see, and the Lamborghini runs wide, and the BMW, nothing to do with this battle, <laughs> just slides ahead. So I think mm. that will be, eventually, we'll be wondering, what was that all about? And uh, the contact, which was very, very slight. Let's look again and see 
Lawrence Van Force coming, coming, coming. Not really in a position to do something, but just, well, it's it's the lightest of bumps, and I don't know whether that's going to be brought to the attentions of the steward or not. Certainly, it was uh, there was there was light contact, but I don't yeah. know whether that seemed seemed or deemed to be an unfair pass. There is the race leader, Kevin S. He's in traffic now. The car pitted the second time while there was that confusion around the safety car and it hadn't got the whole pack behind it. So Kevin S was able to come out in effectively clear track space and then go like smoke to try and catch up to anything because he had the clear road ahead. And that is why as people pitted afterwards, it suddenly rocketed back up the order. At number two, Audi is in strife. And that's the championship leading car. And that was the car, yep, yeah, that led the championship coming into the race and has 23 been involved. It seems sort of a concern on the face of Daryl Cox. So this is Ortelli on board, and it was the 173 Martin wow. Plowman Nissan that arrived out of nowhere well, and glanced the left-hand side. What was that all about? Oof. I mean, whatever the speed the Nissan was travelling at went past the Audi, I mean, it is a zillion miles an hour. Yeah. Can I get all excited about the Jaguar? It's leading Pro-Am. Gabriele Gardel, the former FIA GT champion, is at the wheel, and the Emil Frey Racing Jaguar GT3 is leading the Pro-Am class. This is how the Pro-Am standings are in terms of the race order. Jaguar, Mercedes, Ferrari is the top three. So the Jaguar leads the way. Number 70, Mercedes runs in second place. Cedric Riazzioli's Ferrari is the one in third. Uh, and then Michael Lyons' Ferrari is in fourth place. Fifth is Sean Johnston in the Mercedes. And sixth now, Michael Meadows in number 32, Aston Martin. Uh, it's seventh in the class, is 66, which is the next of the Ferraris. Stephen Parov at the wheel of the car. But the Jaguar, we talked early in the race about how that has got better and better and better. Well, it's had one podium at Silverstone, now it leads the class. And with 35 minutes to go, would it not be a great way to end the season in Pro-Am if we could have the Jaguar as a winner? Now, this is how the AM Championship is going to pan out. Look at this, Ian Loggy, Julian Westwood on the same number of points as Jürgen Herring, Dimitris Constantinou and Frank Schmickler. Now, Loggy and Westwood had a win at Spa, but the Porsche team have not, I think I'm right in saying, had a victory all season. So on a tie break, it would go to the Audi squad because they've had a win. And under braking, he tries to close back up. The Acuria cost BMW to the left. They're going to have to get past Ollie Bryan here. He and Alex have raced against each other in modern GT and historic sports cars as well. And this is Stephen Kane's chance. A little bit of contact there as he tried to get up the inside. The Nissan being oh, compromised by the BMW, he runs wide. Stephen Kane's alongside, he's on the outside line for the next corner, but he's done it right round the outside. He got wrong-footed by the BMW, and uh, the choice went to Stephen Kane. He got the clear shot out of turn three through turn four, and poor Alex Bunkham had nothing he could do. He was wrong-footed by the BMW, and he couldn't adapt or adjust quickly enough to prevent Stephen Kane seizing that opportunity. And number seven must give back the position to number 23, it says on the timing screen. The Bentley must give the place back to the Nissan, and that presumably has to be because of the contact. I would assume that's the only thing I can see. I don't see how that contact had any significant bearing, other than I suppose Nissan would say, well, he bumped into the back of us and unsettled the back of our car, and we were then slightly forced out wide. So that's a judgment from the race director. So number seven is going to have to concede. Well, no one saw that one coming, least of all Stephen Kane. There's nothing to be nothing to be gained. Just let the, the, the Nissan. There he goes. goes. So the Nissan goes through, ironically, almost at the same <laughs> part of racetrack where this all. So now he's going to come back immediately. I mean, he should have been under the rear wing. The minute the Nissan went ahead, I'd have been right under the back of the Nissan again. So with what 11 and a half minutes to go. Stephen Kane has not given up again, closes right up, oh, gets the nose oh. up inside the Nissan, but the drag, the power of the Nissan will have it into turn one ahead. But Stephen Kane, if he can stand his ground on the inside, might have a chance. Where's the nose of the Nissan? It's still on the outside line. This time, surely Stephen Kane is going to get the job done under braking for turn one. Yes, he's done it at last. He goes deep into the corner. Alex Bunkham tries to get the undercut and get level with him to turn two, but Stephen Kane has done it. The last thing Alex Bunkham wanted was having had to deal with a whole stint of a Bentley headlights burning into the back of your car. You've now got a set of Audi headlights burning into the back of your car. And it's six and a half minutes to go, and it isn't over. And it, again, traffic could be the factor that brings an overtake into play. Lawrence Van Thor wants the podium. He likes the podium, <laughs> and he's got the momentum again. He's, he's positive, where Alex is having to be defensive yeah. and by nature than negative. So one more lap to run. S is the leader. The Von Rahn Racing McLaren is set to be the first double winner in the championship. 
and it will be the only double winner because the class battles below in Pro-Am and Am will be for first-time winners. To turn four, they come, and Vantor up the inside, up the kerb as well. Doesn't quite pay off, he had to back out of it, but Vantor committed. But the big Nissan pulls away in a straight line. The turbo kicks in, the Audi slots in behind. More nervous faces at Nissan. So Est into the chicane for the last time. It is going to be a second win of the year then for Davy Ryan's team, Von Ryan Racing, for Kevin Est, for Rob Bell, who did the first in for Shane Van Gisbergen, who we barely saw in the middle because the car wasn't really in contention at all. But it's in contention when it counts for a race win for McLaren. Kevin Est wins the final round of the Blanc Pan Endurance Series. A win for Dave Ryan there, along with his co-drivers, Rob Bell, Shane Van Gisbergen, the partners in the race for Kevin Est. Second will go the way of Stephen Kane, Guy Smith and Andy Merrick. And third will be Alex Buncom, Wolfgang Riper, Katsum Azuchio to win Pro Cup in the Blancpain Endurance Series for Bob Neville's Nissan team. And there is a great reception for that from the Nissan guys hanging over the pit wall. Tremendous job done by Alex Buncom in the last stint. Lawrence Vantor comes home fourth. And I think Wolfgang Riper, yes, there he is. <laughs> has made his way out of the hard car. Bob Neville on the headset, hopefully saying, well done, Alex. Wolfgang Ripe embraces Katsuma Sachio. Now this is Pro-Am, and the Jag is still in the lead, but only just the championship-winning Ferrari is getting in the way because it's from the same team as AF Corsa, and there's a bit of team orders going on to try and let the Ferrari get through the yellow car, operated by the same team. He's trying to find a way by, but 51 Ferrari eventually... No, doesn't let the Jaguar pass. It's going to be a sprint to the line. Gabriele Gardel there to fend off Cedric Sprezioli. AF Corsa trying to use one car to help the other. Up towards the line they come, and as they took the chequered flag, the Jaguar wins by three tenths of a second. Fantastic! What a race. So much to talk about, so much going on. Bob Neville must be a very, very proud team manager. A dream come true, I suspect, for him. And he is ready to talk to OJ. Bob, I would guess yeah. that was the longest half an hour of your life so far. Longest three hours. <laughs> what a win, yeah. though. How'd you feel? Well, absolutely over the moon. So tense, that, you know, with the... Uh, we weren't sure if, if the Audi got us, whether we'd be on equal points then with the Bentley. And... Uh, that was as close as you need to get. And how excited were you to see how much it meant, not just to you, not just to the drivers, but to the whole of the Nissan team? Well, they've just worked tirelessly, so, yeah, fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's not just a race win, it's not just a championship win, it's many, many years of hard work. So, McLaren, Bentley, Nissan, the top three in the Pro Cup. Pro-Am, Jaguar, Ferrari, Ferrari. As the celebrations begin, Kevin Esk gets out of the car. Rob Bell there to congratulate him. Shane Van Gisbergen comes across as well and waits for the reception that Alex Buncombe is going to get, along with Captain Masaccio and Wolfgang Ripe. Shake of the head, he can't believe it, because Alex Buncombe, after that stint, has secured the Pro Cup in the Blancpain Endurance Series. Alex Buncombe gets out of the car a champion and, in modest fashion to begin with, walks over to the team to start the celebrations. And it was a great job done. I think Alex can't believe it. There's a lot of emotion in that crash helmet, I'm sure. All the pressure for the last hour, and he's done it. And Alex, who's worked for so many years to prove that he is a good GT racer, as I said in commentary in the race, he's still overlooked by many. There's, for some reason, there's this sort of unfashionable air to Alex. That people don't latch onto him in the same way that they uh, lionise other British drivers. But he has proved that he's every bit as good as those with a higher profile and he's loyal to the Nissan brand as well. Let's hear from the race winners, first of all. John has got them, Rob Bell goes first. Rob Bell, congratulations, you. you. have won the race, starting from the 12th row of the grid. Yeah, absolutely, we, I don't know if it's a bit unexpected or not, but look, we hung on in there, we kept it clean. Uh, I think we all, we didn't hit anyone, we did a great job in that respect, and the guys back in the, uh, the paint really deserve it because they made the calls on the safety car when we pitted, and that really gave us the impetus. And uh, Kevin did a great job at the end to keep it keep it uh, clean and, and actually pulled away. So in the end, it looked quite comfortable. Kevin, you had the pleasure of bringing the car across the line first. Weren't really challenged, but they, that pit stop and the timing of it just really worked to your advantage. Yeah, I think the guys behind the monitor, you know, uh, James Carter and Andrew and, uh, and Dave did a great job. And we just caught the right moment on the pit stop on both times. And uh, we made a lot of time there, no, no major issue anywhere. And uh, the car was great. I could, 
I had a I had a small gap at the, at the beginning of my stint, and I could pull a, a bigger gap while the other were fighting, and then I was just controlling it. So mega, the car was really constant, and I'm I'm really happy to uh, to finish this this championship on the uh, on the highest place. And I think we could have uh, we could definitely have won this championship without a a small problem with another car in Paul Ricard. We're running out of time, Shane. Well done. Just say well done to the folks in New Zealand. Oh, it's awesome. So good to be up here, but. Um... Thank you to the team, the strategy race, pitted on 40 minutes in, it was unbelievable that we made it, so um, just stoked to be here, thanks for the team. How about that? The Nissan drivers are victorious, and of course it was here earlier on in the season that uh, the Nissan had big dramas in an earlier race, we'll come to that in a moment, let's hear from the Nissan drivers. Congratulations guys! Champions, you were in a terrible state. Yeah. You were in your car watching, I don't know what you're watching. You looked like you had no rear grip for over half your stint. Tell us about Alex, what was it like? First I'd like to say just thank you to everyone involved. It's an uh, unbelievable feeling. Um, we've worked so hard as a team and you know, to get the championships, uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic. So I'm a little bit shocked. So. Uh, yeah, you might want to speak to Chia first. <laughs> well, I can see you're overwhelmed with emotion, but just tell me, we were saying that you had no rear end grip. Was that the problem ultimately? Yeah, I mean, I, had, I started the stint on new tyres, and we know the GTR's not the kindest on its tyres, and I knew I had Kaney behind me. He was going to be quick, and he was, and to start with, there wasn't a lot in it. He had a few tenths on me, and then uh, I knew my tyres were going to go more, more than the Bentley. It's been like that all season, and uh, yeah, just... Well done, champion! Wolfgang, yeah. you had a great stint as well, but were you really sitting in your car? You sure you couldn't watch it? Yeah, yeah, I couldn't watch it anymore. Honestly, uh, I was uh, waiting because uh, it was too much emotions for me. <laughs> you got to control those emotions. You're a racing driver. Uh, yeah, when I'm in the car, but not outside. <laughs> anyway, well done. Congratulations. Chio san yeah. you're almost, you can't say very much, really. Yeah, it was an incredible race. Uh, we are now champion. I couldn't expect it. It's difficult to say how to say, you know. The team did a really great job, and uh, Alex Bandy was great run. Uh, it was the longest time in my life, and the last minutes. It's, uh, yeah, I want to say thanks for the whole of the team involved. This team, Team Argen, it's fantastic. This is good for me. Thank you very much. Well, you've all done a wonderful job. I'll tell you what, back in Japan, you're going to be number one as well. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to fight again in Super Japan. But I, I, I couldn't think it. I just, you know, emotion the, the moment. So thank you very much. Well, congratulations, all of you. Well done, Wolfgang. Well done, Alex. And uh, go off and celebrate. I'm sure you will. Yeah, here earlier on in the year, there was the serious accident that Nissan was involved in in the VLN race, but the team has regrouped and the success here, testimony to how everybody has come good. And uh, there, more happy scenes. This, just going back a few moments, was how Gabriele Gardel was greeted as the winner of Pro-Am by the Emil Frey team, carrying their man aloft to celebrate. <laughs> Let's have a look, first of all, at how the overall results were. Race results, first of all, 88 laps done, and it was a win for the Shane Van Gisbergen, Rob Bell, Kevin S. McLaren, ahead of the Bentley of Guy Smith, Andy Merrick, and Stephen Kane, and the Pro Cup champions, Ketsu Masuchio, Wolfgang Reip, and Alex Buncombe. Fourth was Audi number one, ahead of the second Bentley. Lamborghini's best was sixth in the end, ahead of the Santalock Audi, the Dolby Plowman Walkinshaw Nissan eighth. That Falcons Mercedes was ninth and faded a bit, and the motorbase Aston Martin we hardly saw, but Rory Butcher brought it home in tenth position. In Pro-Am, 17th overall was Gabriele Gardel, second Cedric Spriazzioli and Adrian Delina, they're under investigation. And third was the Michael Lyons, Bromniewski, Alessandro Bonaccini, Ferrari, that finished in 19th place overall. The Am Cup winners, Anthony Pons and Fabian Bartes. Ian Loggi and Julian Westwood, the champions by just one point in the end from Jürgen Herring, Dimitris Constantino and Frank Schmickler. Steve Earle and Liam Talbot and Marco Zanettini end up third after a pretty subdued race by their standards, it must be said. Fourth, not here this weekend, Andre Berzin, Fabio Mancini and Rino Mastronardi. Um, but for the accident at Spa, Oliver Grutz and Karim Oje would have been more of a threat in the championship, taking uh, fifth in the end. A Pro-Am win for the first time for the Emil Frey Jaguar, for Gabrielli Gardel, Lawrence Frey and Freddy Barth. So let's double check the points in Pro-Am. It was already won, of course, by Duncan Cameron and Matt Griffin. 
Second in the championship goes the way of Alessandro Bonaccini, Michael Brozniewski and Michael Lyons ahead of Francisco Guedes. Then Stuart Leonard and Michael Meadows ahead in turn of Marco Asma and Alexei Vasiliev with some of the absent drivers, Jimmy Bruni, Pasin Lathoras next in the standings. Much of that based on how people did at Spa, of course, with those triple opportunities to score points. And AF Corsa, the winning team, Kessel racing second, and Leonard Motorsport in third, the Aston Martin team. Emil Frey racing fourth ahead of GT Russian team. And then Rinaldi, sixth from Black Falcon, Ikuria Kos, and the second of the Nissan GT Academy team, RJN cars outscoring Team Russia by Barwell with Demon Tweaks. That's the top 10 in Pro-Am. The winners for the second time this year, the only double winners in the championship this year, Shane Van Gisberg and Rob Bell and Kevin Est for Von Ryan Racing. Champagne everywhere and three different stories, a race winner, a champion and the vanquished, both in the race and in the title race. Two seconds, if you like, out of that for the Bentley drivers. Second in the race, second in the championship, but it certainly wasn't for the want of trying because they threw everything at it as we check the points at the end of the Pro Cup. Alex Buncombe, Katsumasa Chio and Wolfgang Wright victorious in the end by three points over Stephen Kane and the American Guy Smith. Stefan Ortelli and Frank Stippler almost anonymous in that race. And Rob Bell, Kevin Est and Shane Van Gisbergen in the end fourth. Just think what it might have been, but for Paul Ricard and but for Spa. So the class winners being joined by AF Corsa representatives and I think anybody who wants to get on the podium now is going to join in. So <laughs> it's going to be a very, very long photograph, this, to be orchestrated. But the three class champions, and remember Matt Griffin and Duncan Cameron wrapped it up at Spa, and now the celebrations begin. Ian Loggy and Julian Westwood for Stuart Parker's team. Team Parker Racing winning the AM class by just a point, but a win's a win. Third on the track was enough to give Pro Cup Championship honours, though, to Alex Buncombe, Wolfgang Reif and Ketsomasa Chio for Bob Neville's Team RJN squad. Another tremendous race in the Blancpain Endurance Series. Next year can't come soon enough. Bye for now.